In this video, we're going to try to summarize the um, basic introductory concepts in this lab on kinetics of fading dye, and we're going to talk about how to analyze your data. So the dye that we're looking at in this experiment was crystal violet, and we're just going to represent that here as CV. Um, some groups may have used the dye malachite green. If you did, we had a small problem with that in today's experiment, and so you're going to have to switch to crystal violet for the second part of the experiment. So I'll, I'll just talk here about crystal violet. So we're reacting crystal violet, which is a bright purple dye, with sodium hydroxide, which contains the hydroxide ion, and that will produce products. So this is a very simplified chemical reaction. So the dye, crystal violet, is bright purple, and hydroxide, sodium hydroxide, is colorless, and the products, as a result of this reaction, are also colorless. So because the only thing here, the crystal violet, the reactant, is purple, the title of the lab, the fading dye, the purple color is going to fade over time as it reacts with the hydroxide ion from sodium hydroxide. The lab falls into two basic parts, and the second part can be further subdivided. In the first part of the lab, what you need to do, what you did on day one, was a Beer's Law analysis. So day one, Beer's Law. You were given a stock solution. The stock solution had a concentration of crystal violet of 25 micromolarity. And you remember micromolarity means 25 times 10 to the minus 6 molarity. Your job was to prepare a, a series of dilutions, and you weren't given any guidelines as to how to do that, but you needed four or five or six uh, different test tubes with different concentrations of crystal violet. So you should have set up a table, test tube number one, number two, number three, etc. So at least five or six test tubes probably. Um, you probably would have wondered about the volume of crystal violet that you were going to put in those test tubes and a volume of water, distilled water, that you're going to add to that as well. And then if you haven't done so already, you could put in a, another column, concentration of crystal violet, and maybe even another one, absorbance. So, so I'm sort of mixing here a data table and results tables. So in the first test tube, just as a simple example, and you, you had lots of choices here, right? We said that in the end, we needed to have enough solution to rinse and fill a cuvette. And the cuvette is a small little plastic uh, a uh, square container, sort of like a test tube. We said that 10 milliliters would be a uh, minimum volume that you would need total, and maybe 15 or 20 mils would be sort of a maximum because you're going to waste chemical if you, if you make too much. So basically, most people, I think, ma made around 10 mils or 15 mils. So for example, someone may have chosen to take um, the first test tube and put uh, 10 mils of the crystal violet and no water. So that means their concentration of crystal violet isn't different from the stock solution, so it would be 25 times 10 to the minus 6 molarity. You could also just put 25 micromolarity if you prefer. In the second test tube, maybe they used only 7.0 milliliters, and we were pipetting, so we should probably put point zeros, and now maybe they, they added 3.0 mils of water to keep the total volume the same. And this is just one way to do this. I'm sure lots of groups did it in slightly different ways. But now what they could do is to calculate the concentration of crystal violet, they need to do a dilution calculation, right? Dilutions C1V1 is C2V2. The moles of crystal violet before you diluted is equal to the moles after you diluted. The C1, of course, is our stock concentration. The V1 is the volume of crystal violet that you used in that trial. V2 is the total volume at the end. So in this example, 10 mils was the total volume. And so you're calculating C2, the concentration, after you diluted. And that's what would go in this space here. So you're going to do that for each of your five or six test tubes. And you'll now know a series of concentrations of crystal violet. The color, of course, would go from the darkest in the original stock solution, and it should get lighter and lighter as you're diluting it with water.
you then, we, we looked at a spectrum for crystal violet. We saw this using the uh, spectral viz, the more expensive um, device, and you actually, most of you used your um, handheld devices, your, your uh, cell phones or your iPads to get this on your device wirelessly. So in this, in this uh, spectrum, we looked at different wavelengths of light in nanometers and absorbance. And for crystal violet, the graph looked something like this, if I recall. And this point here we saw was at about 590 nanometers. And it had a an absorbance, I believe, of about 1.5 units on the y-axis. But the maximum, we say lambda max, the wavelength of maximum absorbance was about 590 nanometers. The problem is that our colorimeters that we used only had four different wavelengths to use, and we saw from this graph that a wavelength, one of the choices on there was 565 nanometers, so 565, and it was not only close to lambda max, but it actually had a pretty large absorbance value as well. So we said that was a good wavelength to use to study Beer's Law. There was another choice over at, I think, 635 nanometers. The problem with that, although it's still reasonably close, is that the absorbance there had dropped off quite a bit, so it would have had a very low absorbance value. For those that did malachite green on day one with Beer's Law, the problem that we discovered too late, my fault, was that the solution's concentration was so low that your absorbance values started off really small, and therefore um, they dropped off very quickly as you diluted your solutions. That's why we're scrapping malachite green, and I'll try to fix that in next year's experiment. So basically, we selected 565 nanometers and we measured the absorbance values of each solution at that wavelength, so 565 nanometers, what, how much light was absorbed by each of our solutions, and you would have had a series of numbers here. You want to now do a Beer's Law plot on your graphing calculator. So you're going to create a scatter plot, like we've done many times in class. You're going to put your absorbance values on your calculator in list one or two or three you choose. You're going to put your concentration values of crystal violet in, in another list. And then you're going to create a scatter plot with those two lists of numbers. And we expect, by using Beer's Law, to see a linear graph. We want the equation of that line. So once you've done this on your graphing calculator, you're then going to do linear regression to get the equation of that line. And the equation will look something like this. The absorbance value will equal. The slope of that line is going to be some ugly number, 3.61 times 10 to the minus 5. I'm just making that up, so don't, don't copy this. 3.61 times 10 to the minus 5 times the concentration of crystal violet. Now, theoretically, the y-intercept should be 0, but for a variety of reasons, like scratches on the cubet, things like that, it may not be exactly 0, so there will probably be a very small y-intercept. It may be positive like this. It may be negative. Um, it doesn't matter. So I'm just going to put a positive one in here, plus 0 0.00231, something like that. So there's an equation that I would have got using linear regression on my graphing calculator using that data. If I take that equation, I can rearrange it to say concentration of crystal violet equals and fill that in. So just take this equation and rearrange it to solve for concentration of crystal violet. The whole point of this first part of the lab is this. We're developing an equation to convert absorbance values that we measure into concentrations of crystal violet. So now we've got this equation ready to go, crystal violet concentration as a function of absorbance values. Now day two of the experiment is where we actually do the kinetics run. So this is the grade 12 chemistry portion of the lab. So this is the kinetics part. So kinetics. Notice in the first part of the lab, 
we actually didn't do any reaction between crystal violet and the hydroxide. All we did was dilute the crystal violet and measure its absorbance. So in day two, we're now actually going to use the reaction between crystal violet and the hydroxide to make products. And we want to study the kinetics of that reaction using an integrated rate law approach. Now on your lab quest, you should have uh, after you selected your wavelength, again, because it's crystal violet, we're using the 565 nanometer wavelengths. You then, of course, calibrate it again using distilled water. Right? Our solutions contain distilled water, so we're calibrating, telling the lab quest to eat, that the absorbance of distilled water is zero. That way, the absorbance of the crystal violet is the only thing that will be measured. So we calibrated with distilled water. Then we clicked on the rate mode option, sorry, the rate, um, uh, yeah, mode rate, I think is what it's called, sorry, on the lab quest, on the front on the front screen of the lab quest, and we selected a time based experiment. Okay, from the options there. And then you you should have selected a duration of the experiment somewhere between ten minutes and fifteen minutes. So you, you told it to run the experiment for 10 minutes or 12 minutes or 15 minutes. You also selected a um, sampling rate. You didn't want to collect thousands of data points. So you probably, if you were going for 10 or 15 minutes, you probably told it to collect two samples per minute or maybe three samples per minute. Of course, that would mean every 30 seconds or every 20 seconds. And then that would give you between 20 and 30 data points, something like that in that range. So you had a sampling rate of two samples per minute or maybe three samples per minute. You then had to decide with your partner on two different trials, we needed to know the concentration of crystal violet and hydroxide. So we're going to do two trials, trial one and trial two. And in trial one and two, we were going to keep the concentration of crystal violet constant. So that had to be the same. And we were going to change the concentration of hydroxide. I'll explain why in just a moment. But these two numbers, crystal violet in trial one and crystal violet in trial two, were the same. And in trials one and two, you changed the concentrations of hydroxide. So maybe this was A and still A, this was B, and now it's C. So we kept the crystal violet the same, and we changed hydroxide. And there's a reason for that. Now the, the stock solution, again, was 25 times 10 to the minus 6 molarity of the crystal violet. The hydroxide concentration was much higher. It was 0.1 molarity. So you and your partner decided what volumes of these to use. And again, we don't need huge volumes. So most people would keep maybe 20 mils total, maybe 30 mils total, somewhere in that range, maybe 10 mils total. And so what they, what they just have to have enough solution, again, to rinse and fill the cuvette once it's mixed. So for example, maybe somebody took um, 10 mils of crystal violet and 10 mils of hydroxide. That would be fine. Now, you also want to have a column for water. In trial one, in that example where they took 10 mils and 10 mils, maybe they added no water. In trial two, to keep the crystal violet the same, they still used 10 mils, but now maybe they used 5 mils of hydroxide instead of 10. To keep the total volume the same, they then used 5 mils of, of water to, to, to top it up to 10 mils. So now what you have is um, different volumes and total volumes and you know initial concentrations. So you can again do a dilution calculation to find the starting concentration of crystal violet in each trial and the starting concentration of hydroxide in each trial, keeping in mind again that the crystal violet concentration should have stayed the same and the hydroxide different. What we're doing in this situation is called flooding the system. 
where it's called flooding because the one concentration, in this case hydroxide, was way larger than the other concentration. So we're flooding the system with hydroxide concentrations or with hydroxide because the concentration of hydroxide is much larger than concentration of crystal violet. Now, why is that important? To do an integrated rate law analysis, we can't have two concentrations like this changing during the reaction. We want only one concentration changing. So what we saw, we drew this in the lab, I'll just remind you, if we're going to measure over time, we, we said at the beginning we're going to do a time-based experiment, and I just realized you can't see that, so there's a time-based experiment, and let's on this y-axis show the concentration of both chemicals. And because there's such a wide difference, I'll just put a little break in the axis like that. So the crystal violet will start at some initial concentration, which you'll calculate again by dilution. You know the initial concentration was 25 micromolar. You know the volume you used and the total volume, so you can find its initial concentration after mixing. And we expect over time that that will drop because it's fading. That's the purple substance. Let's assume that it's not a zero-order reaction. Maybe it is. If it is zero, then we expect this to drop with a linear graph. But let's just assume for this argument that it's dropping like this with a curve. So it's, it's dropping like that over time. And that's the concentration of crystal violet. Well, what would be happening in that same time to the hydroxide concentration? Well, it's starting way up here. There's your hydroxide concentration. And because it's much larger than crystal violet, we're going to start it way up there. Well, during the course of the 10 or 15 minutes of the experiment, the crystal violet will get used up almost completely. It's going to end up fading almost to colorless. So the crystal violet concentration is going to change by approximately something like 10 to the minus 6 molarity. If it started close to 10 to the minus 6 molarity and finishes at 0, then it drops by almost 10 to the minus 6 molarity. The hydroxide in a 1 to 1 ratio, remembering the reaction is 1 to 1 ratio, the hydroxide is going to drop by the same amount. But it's starting at a much higher level, 0.1 molarity. So if it starts by 0.1 molarity and only drops by 10 to the minus 6 molarity, that 1 to 1 ratio, it has to drop by the same amount as the crystal violet, what would its graph look like over time? Well, it would look like almost a flat line. It's essentially not changing, right, because of that really high flooded situation. Because it's not changing, a really nice thing happens to the rate law. The differential rate law for this reaction would have looked like rate is equal to K times concentration of crystal violet to the X and hydroxide to the Y, right? That was our reaction at the, uh, up above crystal violet reacting with hydroxide. So those are the two reactants. If you're wanting to be really, really uh, specific, you would note that the rate in this experiment is the negative change in concentration of crystal violet over change in time, because crystal violet is the thing that's disappearing, the purple color fading. So that's what we're measuring over time. Negative simply to make the rate positive. As it's disappearing, the change in concentration will be negative. Putting a negative sign in front makes that positive. So that's how our rates are going to be calculated. Rate is equal to K times CV to the X and hydroxide to the Y. If the hydroxide is much larger than CV, so since the concentration of hydroxide is much larger than the concentration of crystal violet, we can say that concentration of hydroxide to the power of Y is essentially constant. Okay, it's technically dropping, but as we just showed, it doesn't drop by much at all, so it's essentially constant. Therefore, we can say that the rate is actually equal to, and here's going to be a strange sounding word, we're going to say that it's equal to something called K pseudo, the pseudo rate constant, times concentration of crystal violet to the power of x. Now, if you compare this new rate law with a pseudo rate constant,
to the original rate law with the actual rate constant, you'll notice that the difference is twofold. Uh, K has now become K pseudo, and somehow hydroxide to the Y is gone. So what's happened? Well, what we're doing here is we're arguing that K pseudo, which actually just means the false rate constant, is equal to the original rate constant times the hydroxide concentration to the power of Y. Because the hydroxide is constant, then together K times hydroxide to the Y is also constant, and so we're simply combining it and calling it the pseudo rate constant. Well, what we have by doing that is a rate law with only one concentration in it, crystal violet's concentration. Now, instead of two concentrations, we're reduced to one. Now we can apply integrated rate laws to that situation. So, and I realize this is a little complicated, but stay with me. You've pressed collect on your lab quest, you collected data over time, and you copied it onto your graphing calculator or onto a piece of paper as well. And what you've got is a data, a table like this now. So times, and probably in minutes, maybe in seconds, and we have absorbance values because the, the colorimeter was measuring absorbance values, and the time was going up by half minutes, perhaps, maybe every 20 seconds, it was up to you, so one minute, 1.5 minutes, etc. And for each of those times, the colorimeter gave you an absorbance value, so you have a bunch of absorbance values here as well. If you recall, on day one, you derived an equation from Beer's law to convert the absorbance values into molarities. So this is from your Beer's law equation. We can take all of those absorbance values and convert them into concentrations of crystal violet. Now we have a column with time values and a column with crystal violet concentrations. If this is being done directly on a graphing calculator, then these might be in list one, the times. The absorbances might be in list two. And now in list three, you've converted the absorbances to concentrations. You can now go ahead and make your three scatter plots, right? One of them would be concentration of crystal violet versus time. The other would be the natural log of crystal violet concentration versus time. And the third would be the reciprocal of crystal violet concentration versus time, because we're testing for zero order, first order, or second order kinetics for crystal violet. Let's just suppose, for argument's sake, that for these three graphs, we discover that the third one is linear. And we remember that for a second order graph, it's a rising straight line. This may or may not be true. I'm just using this as an example. So from this situation, we know that normally we would say that the slope of that line is the rate constant. But we've done this little trick. And for us, we're studying this rate law, which means the slope of our line is not the rate constant, it's the pseudo rate constant. And the pseudo rate constant is equal to this. So over here, we would do linear regression on this linear graph to find the slope. And we would argue that that slope is equal to the pseudo rate constant, which is equal to the actual rate constant times the hydroxide concentration to the power of y. Now, you repeat that experiment with your second concentration of hydroxide, and you'll have a second data set like this, and you can make another graph like this, and you'll have another slope like this. So what you'll have is from trial one's linear graph, you'll have a slope, let's call it m1, which will equal the pseudo rate constant, which is K times the hydroxide concentration to the power of Y. From your second graph, trial two, the linear graph from trial two, which should be the same as the linear graph from trial one, right? If it was second order in the first trial, it has to still be second order in the second trial. The slope of that second graph will equal K times hydroxide concentration to the power of Y.
you know both of the slopes. And we know, because we prepared the solutions, the concentration of hydroxide in each of those solutions. Just to remind you, you, you the original stock solution was 0.1 molarity. You used two different amounts in trial 1 and 2, and you knew the total volumes. So you can do your dilution calculation to get the hydroxide concentration in each trial. So you know the two slopes, and you know the two concentrations, so therefore, with two equations, we have two unknowns, the rate constant and the, val and the y values. So if you simply now solve the system of two equations, two unknowns, you can find the value of k and the value of y. You'll now know the order for crystal violet, you'll know the rate constant, and you'll know the order for hydroxide. All right? That's a complicated uh, kinetics problem because we were trying to perform a, an integrated rate law analysis with two reactants. The way to do that is to reduce it to a situation where only one thing is changing, and we did that by flooding the system with hydroxide. So our rate law went from this complicated rate law with two reactants to a simpler pseudo rate law with one reactant. Okay? The graphical analysis will let us determine the order of the crystal violet, and instead of getting a rate constant, we'll know what the pseudo-rate constant was. Pseudo-rate constant is the actual constant times the flooded sub substance to the power of y. Because there's two unknowns there, we did two trials in order to get two slopes, two pseudo-rate constants, two hydroxide concentrations, and now we can find x and or k and y because we have two equations with two unknowns. So I hope that helps. There's a it's complicated. If you if you don't quite get it, you shouldn't feel bad. Um, but and so come in and ask for some help. Ask through Edmodo if you need to. Um, definitely help each other. Be sure you're recording things on loose leaf, good tables, sketching the graphs that you're making on your graphing calculator, and using the uh, scatter plots and linear regression as well. Good luck with those calculations.